Okay, good morning everybody and welcome to the first Dizzy McLean University class of 2016. I'm your host Jim Huseman and presenting our wastewater treatment systems class today is Tom Schoendorf from Highland Tank. Uh, we have a very informative class for you today. Uh, as always, if you have any questions, use the uh, chat feature at the bottom right of this program and we'll answer each question in turn at the end of the class. Um, so yeah, without any further delay, I'll pass this over to Tom. Thanks, Jim, and good morning, everybody. Uh, as Jim said, my name is Tom Schoendorf with Highland Tank. I've been with the company coming up on 22 years. I work as a division manager overseeing the wastewater treatment systems. Uh, we also have in the line uh, Paul Miller with Highland Tank. He's our new regional sales manager. Uh, thank you, Jim and Disney McLean, for setting this up. Uh, Disney McLean is our Highland Tank contracted rep for Kentucky, Ohio, and Indiana for the wastewater treatment systems. So just to get started today, uh, we're going to go through a, a brief introduction of the company we work for, Highland Tank. And Highland Tank is a manufacturer of quality steel storage tanks since 1946. So we're coming up on 70 years in business. Uh, it is all a U.S. manufacturing uh, company, and we've been building wastewater treatment tanks since the mid-1980s. The factories are located up the east coast of the U.S. The corporate office is in Storystown, Pennsylvania, which is about an hour and a half east of Pittsburgh. And then we have factories located from North Carolina all the way up through Pennsylvania to Albany, New York, a small town called Watervliet, New York. As far as our uh, manufacturing capabilities, uh, we manufacture uh, square footage areas just under 300,000 square feet with all of our six plants combined. Uh, we can roll up to one and a quarter inch thick steel. And uh, as far as physical uh, fabrication capabilities, you know, we're basically a UL uh, shop tank manufacturer. So anything we can build in the factories and put on trucks and ship them around the U.S. is as big as we can go. So UL lets us build shop-built tanks, uh, just over 70,000 gallons in a horizontal configuration. And then vertical tanks, uh, we can go to 57,500 gallons. ASME pressure vessels, we go from uh, a couple hundred gallons up to 60,000. And if you look at some of our uh, capabilities, again, we move tanks through fabrication processes in the factories with uh, the yellow overhead cranes you see on the, on the picture. But uh, we move these tank tanks through. Uh, the highest diameter or tallest tank we can build is 14 feet diameter by 90 feet long. And it's really uh, shipping restrictions. Uh, it's a lot more cost effective to ship a tank that's 12 foot diameter than it is 13 or 14 feet, but we can certainly do it. Everything that uh, we're going to talk about today, we can do single or double wall construction. Uh, double wall construction has become very popular over the years, uh, especially when you're going underground with wastewater treatment tanks. And these double wall configurations can be cylindrical or rectangular in design. Double wall typically means there's a, uh, a monitoring well where we have a leak sensor at the bottom of the tank to detect any fluids that migrate into the interstice. We manufacture to very strict UL standards, Underwriters Laboratory, and basically this tells us how we build the tanks. Uh, steel thicknesses in relation to volume of vessel, uh, how we weld the tanks, uh, air test or hydrostatically test vessels, um, you know, coat the tanks. Everything is really a good base guide spec with UL. Follow uh, some Steel Tank Institute uh, procedures and specifications for some of the products we build for SDI. And then we uh, have American Petroleum Institute or API, uh, Southwest Research Institute, SRI, and then the Plumbing and Drainage Institute or PDI are some standards that we follow as a manufacturer. Steel is the material of choice. Uh, we do an awful lot of carbon steel uh, fabrication, but then we also do stainless steel, uh, 304 or 316 stainless. 
So steel has some advantages when you look at constructing a tank, whether it's for liquid storage or a process vessel like wastewater treatment systems. Number one, it has structural strength. So whether you're building this tank for an above ground installation or an underground installation with loads bearing on the tank or high water tables, uh, steel gives us uh, essentially, you know, uh, the structural strength. Time-tested interior and exterior corrosion protection systems. Again, we coat the inside and the outside of the tanks. Uh, superior product compatibility. Again, the products we're storing in these vessels, <clears throat> steel is compatible with all different types of fuel and fuel additives. Flexible designs. Again, we're going to show you some options where we could do internal bulkheads or lift stations within the tank. And the tank is, uh, you know, when we look at steel, steel is 100% recyclable. So as our society moves into a green uh, society, we want material that we can recycle and reuse. And steel is the most recycled material in the U.S. and North America today. So essentially what you're getting is high quality uh, finished product with advanced coating systems. So if we look at this wastewater treatment tank, uh, it has an exterior 75 mil thick coating for corrosion protection. Uh, after we grit blast to an SP6 profile, we'll coat the tank. And then same thing with inside the vessel. We'll coat the tanks uh, with polyurethanes like you see in the picture, or we can switch to high temperature epoxy coatings. We ship all the products on our own fleet of trucks. So we own and operate 40 tractor trailers, uh, like pictured here, that ship all over the U.S. We actually run trucks to California just about every two weeks. Uh, we do um, international work to ports of exit. We can ship tanks to Baltimore or different harbors of exit, and they can ship it overseas. Jim, are you hearing me okay? Uh, yes, I am. You sound good. Okay, great. So uh, just kind of finishing up the introduction of Highland, uh, and I'll go into the uh, heart of the presentation here. Uh, we manufacture four different product divisions, uh, petroleum and chemical storage tanks. Today I'll be talking about wastewater treatment systems. We also manufacture ASME pressure vessels and water tank systems, and that includes rainwater harvesting. And then we have grease interceptors for kitchen and food processing drainage systems where we intercept fog or fat oil and grease. So if you want to learn more about our company or any of the other products, uh, highlandtank.com. We've got, uh, you know, a nice website with uh, literature, drawings, and specifications. Uh, there's sizing programs on there as well, so feel free to visit that. So today's presentation, we're going to talk about wastewater treatment systems. And really, when we look at this presentation, uh, we look at really wh what's the application. Uh, we're going to be talking about oil water interceptors and oil water separators that ins are installed uh, to pick up surface water drainage to protect the environment from pollution by oils and oily coated solids. So these vessels uh, will separate the oil from water and retain the oil safely in the tank so it can be removed later by a vac truck. They're installed to contain oil leaks from vehicles, industrial plants, and accidental oil spills from uh, facilities. And to be effective, these products need to be correctly designed, installed, and maintained on a regular basis. So why are oil water separators important? Well, the fact of the matter is uh, petroleum releases are very common in today's society whether it's a large catastrophic release of oil, like you see these firefighters cleaning up, or uh, the more prevalent problem is chronic small oil discharges. And these are leaks and spills from fueling, uh, from vehicle maintenance. Uh, so we get you know, small spills going into the environment, which add up to a lot. So the EPA on the federal level has regulations to prevent these oil discharges into the waterways of the U.S., we have oil pollution regulations, which is the SPCC, or Spill Prevention Control and Countermeasure Plans. These are written plans designed by you folks, the engineers, to prevent oil discharges into the environment. And a lot of times an oil water separator or interceptor will be used to capture that large oil spill and contain it before it goes into the environment. 
And these spill plans are generated by uh, oil volumes at a customer's facility or the location of the facility, they could discharge oil into the waterways. The other regulations we have are storm sewer discharge regulations. These are called the NPDES, National Pollution Discharge Elimination System. And this is a program that started back in the 1970s, phase one, and the EPA targeted industrial activity by SIC codes, or Standard Industrial Classification Codes. So they went after power generation facilities, airports, transportation facilities, manufacturing plants, areas that could generate oily waste and discharge into the environment. And this program has, has uh, you know, added to it over the years. In 2003, we have the uh, NPDS Phase Two coming on the books. Uh, the third regulation you have are sanitary sewer discharge regulations, and these are regional uh, sewer authorities dictating uh, discharges into their sewer systems. So they're very regional, uh, they vary around the country, but on average we see 150 parts per million for oil and grease as the national average. Now there's exceptions to that. You know, New York City, you have 50 parts per million oil and grease. Chicago has 250 parts per million oil and grease limitations. So it does vary, but on average we see 100, 150 parts per million. And that's very important when we talk about some of the product designs in a moment. So the regulations carry over to applications. We see products installed at airports and aircraft services and maintenance hangars, uh, different types of fleets, and they can be uh, automobile, you know, dealerships, uh, you know, uh, city agencies, bus companies, construction companies, uh, garbage carting, you know, we have fleets of trucks. Uh, gasoline service stations, more on the uh, truck stops in the U.S. versus uh, retail gasoline stations, but industrial facilities, manufacturing plants, uh, military installations, municipal, uh, like ODOT, different people are required to use products, railroad facilities, uh, taxi cab companies, trucking, and power utility agencies as well. The three areas of drainage we see uh, directed to a wastewater treatment tank are fueling and dispensing areas. So anywhere you're transferring hydrocarbons uh, from a tank into a vehicle or from a vehicle into a tank, you know, fueling the tanks, you'll see leaks and drips and spills that typically drain to some sort of a wastewater treatment tank. Repair and maintenance shops, uh, so vehicle maintenance, uh, indoor, outdoor maintenance shops, wash areas where they're washing vehicles and equipment, and then stormwater runoff or spill containment where we calculate rainfall versus an indoor drainage system. So again, fueling facilities, you know, here we have a rail, uh, you know, fueling facility. Uh, so, you know, that's a, a very good application when we look at drainage of pollution uh, to something like this. You know, this is a, a dilapidated uh, fueling dispensing system but you can see all the oil all over the ground. Uh, obviously, they have issues. Uh, and again, those fueling facilities, you know, typically will drain to a wastewater treatment tank. Vehicle maintenance, and again, it could be a large, uh, you know, equipment vehicle maintenance shop like this for a DOT or a highway authority to a small uh, shop for a car dealership or a firehouse. You know, vehicle maintenance varies in different types of customers to vehicle wash racks. And again, if you're washing trucks or planes, trains, automobiles, you're gonna have uh, oily waste, you know, solids knocking off into that trench drain and then flow typically to a wastewater treatment tank. Surface drainage from stormwater runoff. Again, if we're looking at an airport or a power facility or transportation, typically there's a lot of paved area where you have rainfall and it's gonna collect and, and drain to a wastewater treatment tank. And these can get pretty big in size. Uh, dike drainage, so if we're looking at fuel storage, uh, usually they're in secondary contained dikes and the dikes have uh, you know, a pipe uh, draining into a wastewater treatment tank where we'll take out the hydrocarbons before discharge into stormwater. Fuel loading and unloading applications, so again, this would be transfer of hydrocarbons. You know, in this process, you'll have leaks and spills. And again, it could be uh, fueling aircraft, it could be fueling a fuel farm, uh, pulling product off. So when we look at these applications, 
We next move to wastewater product selection and design. And the first thing we need to do is kind of differentiate between certain products. So when you look at the definition of an interceptor, this is an oil water or oil sand interceptor. These products are designed to achieve a discharge concentration of less than 100 milligrams or parts per million of oil under standard test conditions. So these products are more suitable for less stringent discharge like into a sanitary sewer uh, I said before, where you're looking at about 100, 150 part per million required. So that's where you'll see the interceptors primarily used. And these interceptors can, can carry different shapes and forms. Uh, we offer a protected steel, but certainly you can see in specifications, concrete, fiberglass, there's different materials of construction, but we, we like to use the uh, coated carbon steel. Uh, here you see a cylindrical unit being installed. Uh, to pick up drainage from a vehicle maintenance facility. And it is a triple basin interceptor, a three compartment unit that has manways above each compartment. So it has three compartments, three manways. It's tied down with uh, hold down straps for a high water table. And if you look at the inside of this thing, uh, we're flowing from left to right. So uh, the tank is filled with clean water on startup. So after the contractor pipes up the inlet and outlet, you know, installs everything, backfills it, you know, hooks up the extension manways uh, coming up to grade level, they'll fill it up with water. And as the oily water comes in through the inlet, <coughs> it hits a diffusion baffle on the front end of the tank that slows down the uh, flow and velocity, turbulence in the tank. Uh, the 45 degree plate directs the flow to the head of the tank uh, using the full length of the vessel to allow oil to rise in water and solids to sink. So that first compartment is going to be your dirtiest compartment. You know, you're going to collect most of the heavy oil as it floats and gets trapped in the compartment and solids that sink. Now there's a transfer pipe from the bottom of each compartment that moves the clean water from each compartment to the next. And as we move through that tank with residence time and uh, you know, it'll allow floating material to float, sinking material to sink, and will discharge on the outlet at about 100 parts per million. So these are acceptable for a lot of different applications, but primarily for sanitary sewer discharges. And again, uh, we see these for parking garages, vehicle maintenance shops, uh, you know, for a lot of different sizes from 350 gallons up to 60,000 gallons. They can also be used for stormwater uh, detention and treatment. Uh, so here we have a stormwater management system. Uh, this happens to be an aviation facility, but uh, the 30 inch concrete pipe on the left uh, has a transition coupling that's coming into an oil sand interceptor. And again, that's holding the water and directing it to the second tank, which is an oil water separator. And that's separating the oil and then discharging. So this is functioning as a, a first flush uh, treatment system directing it to the oil water separator. But the wastewater uh, applications on the bigger flows, uh, we can take the interceptor and design it where it has a series of perforated baffles on top of the tank to separate uh, trash, leaves, floating debris. And then the bottom of the tank, we have a series of baffles to take out sediment, TSS, uh, things that'll sink. So again, this application is more aligned at uh, you know, uh, non-industrial type uh, scenarios, maybe parking garages, parking lots uh, for stormwater discharge. The interceptors can be rectangular in design. They can be made from a little 500 GPM up to a, a 500 GPM. Uh, the rectangular is nice because the whole top of the unit comes off in lids or sections. So it makes it very easy for the client to access the unit. And again, these are typically uh, smaller installations, uh, again, but discharging to a sanitary sewer. And it has a series of baffles. It relies on residence time to allow oil to float, solids to sink, and then we're discharging from the outlet pipe at about 100 parts per million. The oil interceptors we've seen used for uh, hydraulic elevator sump pump uh, applications. Uh, typically, they're installed in a mechanical room uh, above the elevator shaft. And again, the uh, oil interceptor is taking the pump flow from a pit inside the elevator shaft where we're pumping uh, with a sensor, and that's pumping the oily water up to the interceptor, 
separating the oil from water, and then discharging into the sanitary sewer system. So depending on jurisdiction, you know, you may see something like this for an elevator sump pump uh, application. The definition of the uh, oil water separator, the second product, an oil water separator is designed to achieve a discharge concentration of less than 15 milligrams per liter or parts per million under normal test conditions. These separators are required for discharges to surface water drains and water environment. So the oil water separators contain coalescing plates and devices which will draw the oil droplets together and facilitate separation. So here we see a, a large 50,000 gallon oil water separator being installed. Uh, this is for a power generation plant and it's, it's designed for stormwater runoff, for rainfall, and then also spill containment for transformer oil. So if a transformer ruptures, this tank will separate and hold the oil as part of an SPCC plan. So here's the inside of the oil water separator. And how this works is very similar. Uh, it gets piped up by the contractor on the inlet and outlet. Uh, it sits in a, a backfill, so it's a direct buried. But these can easily be brought above ground on saddles, but here we're showing a direct buried installation. The tank is full of clean water on startup by the contractor. And now we're moving through a very similar inlet uh, baffle here. Uh, there's a 45 degree plate, which is called the diffusion baffle. As the flow comes in, it slows down the velocity when it hits that baffle and basically directs it to the head of the tank. So we want to use this full length of the vessel to allow oil to rise in water and solids to sink. Now, because we want to get better performance, we'll go ahead and stack inclined plates inside the oil water separators, and that will basically collect and target oil droplets, force them to collide and stick together and coalesce. And the larger the droplet of oil, the faster it's going to rise in water. Now, we have a secondary petrol screen towards the end of the tank that will target very small free-floating oil droplets down to 20 microns. We'll go ahead and coalesce and separate and float to the top of the tank. So what's happening here is we're collecting oil on top of the tank, and it's displacing clean water from the bottom of the outlet pipe at the end of the tank. So this uh, picture you see uh, can all be supplied uh, in specifications and drawings, including the grade covers that interface with the concrete pad uh, so vehicles can drive over the top of this tank safely. Uh, manway extensions that are set 8 to 10 inches below grade so customer can access the inside of this for inspection and cleaning. And uh, hold down straps for high water tables as we said before. These systems can be 350 gallons all the way up to 60,000 gallons. And we rate this for a 10 minute retention time. So flow in gallons per minute is one tenth the volume. So if you have a 10,000 gallon oil water separator, that peak flow is rated for zero to 1,000 gallons per minute. It's rated for a 10 uh, minute retention time. So if you look at the inside of the vessels, a uh, series of baffles to slow down the flow. Uh, that's your inlet velocity head baffle. Again, it's taking the flow on the underside of this baffle and directing it to the head, and then it's moving towards us in the picture. And as the flow moves towards us, it goes through the inclined plates. The inclined plates are angled upwards at about 25 degrees. Uh, there's a sludge baffle at the bottom of that plate, uh, essentially to collect sludge and dirt as it sinks in the waste stream. And there's your secondary petro screen. Uh, that's an oleophilic, oil attracting mesh material made out of polypropylene mesh. Uh, it's built in cartridges that can be removable through the manway and cleaned periodically. So now we get into design uh, issues when we talk about oil water separators for guide specs. Uh, this is showing, uh, you know, an oil water separator. Again, we like the plate technology, but there's other uh, designs out there. We have some people using vertical tubes, ball coalescers. Um, there's a number of different ways to coalesce oil. We like the plate technology because it's been around a long time and it's a proven technology. But we look at design standards. You know, we follow the American Petroleum Institute API, 
Manual 421, and then Underwriters Laboratory, which is UL SU2215 standards. So if you look at the first uh, design issue, we size for a minimal of a 10-minute retention time. Uh, that's typically what we see as an acceptable retention time to allow oil to separate from water. However, when you look at some other guide sets out there, the UPC or Uniform Plumbing Code sometimes requires a 30-minute retention time. Uh, the Army Corps of Engineers with their Uniform Facilities Guide Spec uh, specifies a 45-minute retention time, which again, we can do as a manufacturer. It's just increasing the volume of tank, but we see a minimal as a 10-minute as a good guide spec. Spill capacity, it, we're rating as 50% volume of the tank. So if you have, a, let's say, a 5,000-gallon uh, tanker truck coming to the site, and if it ruptures and you need to capture that oil, we recommend timesing that maximum oil spill capacity by two, and that's the size oil water separator or interceptor tank you'd need. So a 5,000-gallon spill will require a 10,000-gallon vessel or 50% oil storage capacity. We feel uh, reducing volume in any of these interceptors or oil water separators could, you know, adversely affect performance. Uh, you'll increase the horizontal velocity and turbulence in the tank and have a quicker flow through the vessel. And you're going to reduce oil storage volume, solid storage, and have to clean that separator out twice as often. The second standard we follow is the American Petroleum Institute, API 421. This is the design standard for oil water separators. And it basically goes through proper design and operation of oil water separators. It's the latest addition for oil water separator standards. It's older, but it's the latest one that we have available. It provides design calculations for the parallel plate coalescer effective surface area based on Stokes' law. And again, the idea is the larger the droplet of oil, the faster it's going to rise in water. The greater the difference of specific gravity between oil and water, the faster the rise rate of an oil droplet. The higher temperature will be the faster the rise rate of the oil droplet. So with this, the installation of parallel plates increase the separator surface area for better performance of the oil water separator. Parallel plates offer a shorter vertical distance that the oil droplet must travel in the tank before coalescing can begin. So those plates, you know, trap the oil and really speed up that uh, separation process. Again, plates can be designed of different materials. Uh, we use a PVC uh, material that has a flat top and a corrugated bottom, but these can easily be made out of stainless steel, coated carbon steel, plastics, depending on the manufacturing design. Again, we, we angle these plates upwards at about 25 degrees. There's a flat top, so solids will hit that flat top, slide off, and collect in a sludge collection area where that baffle I showed you before. The corrugated bottom plates, as that oil moves through, it hits the underside of the plate and gets trapped in those corrugations, and that forces the oil to collide and stick together. So because they're angled upwards, the oil droplets will creep along the bottom of the plate coalescing more and more as it moves to the top of the tank. And once it breaks off from the sheet, it rises quickly in the water to the top of the vessel. Again, the uh, plate design, you know, we're using a flat top, corrugated bottom. Uh, we're calling it a Corella plate. And again, it's combining a lamella plate that does great at solids removal as they sink, and a corrugated plate that separates oil as it's floating in water. The other design standards we follow are Underwriters Laboratory UL SU2215. This is a code used for oil water separators. It came on the books about 12 years ago. Uh, Highland Tank is one of 30 manufacturers that have tested and passed this UL2215 performance label. It's also a construction label, so it covers everything you'd want with an oil water separator. Most importantly, it offers third-party testing and certifies our effluent quality claims. So we're putting in our design spec 10 part per million on the effluent. UL has tested our unit, and we can put a UL label on the manway saying that's been tested. Uh, the units also have to have internal coatings and stainless steel sensors requiring monitoring of the oil levels inside the vessel. 
We also follow uh, design standards for UL58, which is a construction standard for underground petroleum storage tanks. So when we look at constructing oil sand interceptors and oil water separators, we utilize UL58 as a construction standard. So this tells us how thick the steel has to be in relation to the volume of tank. It tells us how to weld the tank, coat it. Uh, two walls of steel typically with double wall. More importantly, when we get into deep burrow depths, uh, it gives us work calculations by UL58, which determines the load bearing on the tank and how thick the steel has to be and how we reinforce that tank. So another good guide spec for design of, of wastewater treatment tanks. Lastly, we have access. When you look at uh, these type of products, you want to have access into the vessel for inspection and cleaning. We recommend uh, multiple access points in critical areas where you're going to collect solids, where the coalescers are, so you can clean and inspect those regularly. And, uh, you know, cylindrical manways are fine. You can get into some rectangular units that give you more space to work from above. And again, regular inspection and cleaning is required. So you want to have access for the client when you're designing a system like this. So here we move into a couple of projects. Uh, this is an HTC 20,000 gallon oil water separator installed for a power gen facility. Uh, again, there's a high water table. So we have hold down straps that are being anchored to a concrete pad or concrete deadman. A concrete deadman is just a concrete strip that runs along the side of the tank installation and anchors that tank down. And then they'll backfill around the vessel and uh, this will anchor it down. This particular client wanted to have coalescers that were removable through easy access rectangular manways. So this unit is designed where they can hook up a lifting apparatus and pull out those coalescers. And again, you'll see maybe this for more uh, deeper burial depths where access is, is really critical. So the first group of oil water separators we're going to talk about is cylindrical designs. And again, these can be above ground or underground and cylindrical. And keep in mind, as a manufacturer, <clears throat> it's cheaper to roll steel than it is to bend steel. And that goes with all of our products. If, if you can specify a cylindrical vessel, it's, it's less expensive typically than a rectangular, but certainly there's advantages to both. So when you look at cylindrical, uh, here's a, a large installation we completed last year for five 60,000 gallon oil water separators. Uh, they're installed to pick up an industrial facility's drainage for stormwater runoff and spill control of hydrocarbons. So these are installed, uh, you know, parallel to each other. And basically we're, we're taking 5,000, 6,000 GPM peak flow for each tank at a 10 minute residence time or retention time. Here's a 50,000 gallon oil water separator being installed at Denver Airport. So keep in mind, all these are oil water separators because we're discharging back into stormwater. So we want to get down to that certified 15 or 10 part per million for oil and grease. Here's a 10,000 gallon uh, G-series oil water separator. This is for Naval Air Station in Jacksonville, Florida. So here they're servicing uh, Navy aircraft and again, uh, stormwater runoff for treatment. Small applications, uh, car dealerships. You know, we work with several car dealership companies around the country. Uh, this is the Hendrick Automotive Group uh, down the southeast. Here we have a 1,000 gallon G series oil water separator. So we have multiple manways uh, and access into that tank. This is an interesting project for uh, lower Manhattan in New York City. Uh, basically, uh, after 9-11 when the towers fell, uh, they took out a lot of infrastructure and part of that rebuilding process was this 20,000 gallon Highland oil water separator. So this is being installed three stories below street level in a concrete vault. And if you notice, this is a, a white colored tank. Uh, typically when we're going to bury a tank, you'll notice it's green. Uh, that's our two part urethane coating sprayed on at 75 mils. When we do an above ground tank like this, it's a white coating standard and that's an epoxy coat with a, uh, a top coat urethane finish. And the tank is sitting on saddles. Uh, you know, cylindrical tanks sit on saddles for a good foundation on a concrete pad. So although this is going down three stories below grade, it's gonna be in a concrete vault, there's no backfill. 
So it's considered an above ground installation. Now the primary focus or application for this tank is to capture oil from transformers. Uh, so essentially if the transformers rupture, this tank's designed to hold a 10,000 gallon oil spill. So it's sized for a 20,000 gallon oil water separator uh, volume. Now, because we're down so deep in elevation, we're gravity flowing to the inlet. The outlet has effluent uh, lift station in it, so we extend the length of the tank with submersible pumps inside the vessel and floats to automatically kick the pumps on and off. Here's an above ground cylindrical tank uh, for a warmer climate in Florida. Uh, we're using uh, non-emulsifying pumps on the inlet to pump the flow to the above ground unit. Again, you can do a lot of different things with these as far as options. Uh, here we're lengthening the tank and adding an internal grit chamber on the front end of the tank. So the inlet is flowing from the left into the Series G grit chamber. That's knocking out heavy solids and dirt and then flowing into the coalescing area. So these are very nice designs for um, additional retention time, additional uh, storage of solids and dirt for dirty waste streams coming off of you know, heavy vehicle maintenance applications, or even parking garages where you need a strict uh, discharge. Here we have the Series J. Uh, so this, we're flowing by gravity into the inlet, coalescing the uh, uh, oil and water, separating the oil and water in the tank, and then we have a transfer pipe at the end going into a clear well. So uh, this clear well has submersible pumps. We're gonna pump out of the tank and lift it to a higher elevation to meet up with the outlet pipe. And again, all automated with pump on, pump off floats uh, and controls. Next, we move into the rectangular above ground separators. I showed you a couple pictures of above ground cylindrical, but again, there's some advantages to going with rectangular. Number one is access. You know, a rectangular unit's very easy to access. You can pull off lids or, or hatches on the top of this uh, unit and get really uh, uh, good access into the vessel. So this installation is an RHTC 20,000 gallon oil water separator and it's installed for treatment of ships, bilge and ballast water from a Navy base in Virginia. And because we're seeing so much dirt and solids in this waste stream, the engineers designed a sludge hopper on the bottom of this vessel that runs the full length of the tank. So it's a coned or, or a V-shaped uh, bottom and it collects sludge and dirt. There's a red valve on the side there towards the middle of the hopper and that takes sludge and dirt from the hopper uh, to be removed. You also notice there's catwalks and, and railways up on top where personnel can come up on top of the vessel safely and inspect and, and uh, clean out the top of the unit. Here's a, a 2,000 gallon oil water separator installed for groundwater remediation from an industrial facility. And again, we're pumping contaminated groundwater with different hydrocarbons in the water uh, to the oil water separator. And this also has a grit compartment or a series G on the inlet with a hopper bottom. And again, you can remove those solids pretty easily. Now this particular uh, installation has a vertical uh, white tank on the outlet. So we're flowing to the holding tank, and then from there we can pump to the blue filtration skid off to the left there that you can see. Some customers require uh, either high temperatures or corrosive uh, type waste streams that we have to treat, so we offer stainless steel. You know, here's a potash, potash Corporation facility down in Georgia where they required stainless steel material. So very easily to do. Uh, it's just changing up the material of construction. Again, with the rectangulars, we can lengthen the tank, much like I showed you with cylindricals. We can do inlet grit chambers called our Series G, and outlet uh, clear wells with our Series J. Again, just lengthening that tank by about 20% volume and adding another compartment. One thing that we can do with the rectangular units is called a Series S, a side oil compartment. Uh, this is just widening the footprint of the oil water separator. It's installing an oil skimmer pipe that is set at an elevation as the static level rises in the tank, it'll skim the oil off of the top of the water that's separated and drain down into a side oil compartment. So it just gives the client more oil storage capacity 
uh, you know, they can pump the oil out of that side oil compartment with one of our pumps or with a vac hose. We do uh, an internal trickle filter in the rectangular design. Uh, this is just length in the tank, adding an additional absorbent media. So if we're into uh, either high specific gravities of oil and we feel it's not going to separate properly with the coalescers, or if you have oil encapsulated metals or a very strict discharge requirement where you can't you know, discharge at 10 parts per million with a straight oil water separator, we can add an internal uh, trickle filter. The flow will uh, trickle through the bag filters. The media will absorb the hydrocarbons down to low levels before discharge on the outlet. When you look at uh, above ground installations, whether it's cylindrical or rectangular, one issue is influent pumping systems. Now, as a manufacturer uh, and designing equipment, we like to see gravity flow. Uh, it's usually better than pumping to an oil water separator because there's less risk of mechanical emulsions. In other words, the pumps can churn up the water and oil, mix it and cause an emulsion that will be very difficult to separate. So we recommend specifying positive displacement pumps that are low shearing uh, pumps that will suck or push the oily water from the collection sumps to the above ground separator. So here we see a 600 gallon above ground rectangular oil water separator that's installed in an auto plant, manufacturing plant. We mounted the influent duplex pumps on a pump shelf and the contractor installs the suction hoses into an existing concrete pit. So those pits are basically collecting the wastewater and then we're pumping it up to the above ground oil water separator. Now, as a manufacturer, we can design, uh, you know, the sumps and collection uh, areas as well. Here we have a 600-gallon uh, oil water separator for a power plant vehicle maintenance facility. And again, this green thing sticking up uh, in the front of the picture is a sump. It's a cylindrical vertical sump sticking up out of ground about a foot so the personnel can access the bolts on top of it and lift that manway cover off. If you look at the inside of this thing, uh, it has an air-operated diaphragm pump and requires 80 PSI from the compressor, which will operate this pump. Very rugged type pump, very inexpensive, uh, and, and it's air-operated. Now, these can also be designed for electric diaphragm pumps. Uh, the sump gets installed to pick up the gravity flow of the underground piping, so that will come in through the inlet. Uh, the sump has baffles, so it acts like a little interceptor. It will knock out the sludge and dirt. As the early water builds up, it kicks on that air-operated or electric diaphragm pump, and we pump to the above-ground separator. So a nice prepackaged system for retrofitting an existing facility or newer construction. Here's an interesting installation for an oil water separator for the Marcellus Shale. Uh, this particular system is designed for treating frack water. And the frack water is being dumped into this concrete interceptor to the left. And the interceptor is taking out the heavy solids and dirt. The influent is being pumped by this pump in a hot box for freeze protection. And that's a positive displacement pump that's pumping to the above ground rectangular oil water separator. You can see the inlet there. So we're pumping in, uh, separating the oil from water. The separated oil is going into a side oil compartment, an S-series, and again, that is being pumped to the vertical tank, that white tank in the background. So it's removing oil automatically. And then if you notice, these red caps on the bottom of this installation are immersion heaters. So there's freeze protection with this tank being in a colder climate outside. So that's probably the ultimate you'll see with uh, controls offered by a manufacturer, moving liquid to the oil water separator, taking oil and removing it from the tank, heaters, controls, everything with the system. Another portion of wastewater treatment systems, we've talked about oil interceptors, we've talked about coalescing oil water separators. Now we're going to talk about advanced hydrocarbon filtration systems. Again, these are more high-end uh, wastewater treatment products. They're usually skid mounted, uh, designed by, you know, our in-house engineers, you know, and, and really determines what kind of waste we're taking out of the wastewater. And our niche or expertise is removing hydrocarbons from water. 
So any kind of application where you have uh, dissolved hydrocarbons, uh, maybe oil encapsulated metals, uh, different emulsions, you know, that's where we'd really get involved with a filtration system. And typically we'll design an influent suction pump. Uh, this will pump to the uh, bag filters that'll take out any suspended solids or TSS. From there we'll go into canisters of, uh, you know, advanced hydrocarbon filtrations. Uh, systems. And again, these are vertical filters. They sit inside these canisters. And we utilize a filter company um, called MyFlex Technology in Atlanta, Georgia. So we're buying the filters. They have a patented product that is a, a two part polymer that's infused in a nylon filter. And the filter almost looks like a paint roller, but it's a proprietary uh, filter that gets put into these canisters. As the wastewater pumps through, it grabs the hydrocarbon and holds on to it and adsorbs it. So it doesn't release it, and you can dispose of it very easily. So here we have a, a, an installation with an oil water separator uh, and a filtration skid. You know, it's basically taking uh, uh, water from a power plant, recycling it, cleaning it up, and reusing the water. Most of these filtration systems We'll have an oil water separator. So the separator is designed to take out free floating oil, uh, oily coated solids before we go into the filtration skid. And the reason we do that is filtration systems can be very costly, not only for the existing system or the new system, but replenishing the filters. So we want to make sure that, you know, we're taking out the heavy stuff and really just going to the filtration as polishing, getting us down to parts per billion. Here we see an installation for an oil and gas uh, drilling rig in Saudi Arabia. Uh, it's an above ground oil water separator with the filtration skid to the right. Uh, this was a job designed by our filtration company. Uh, here's their technician on site doing the startup. Uh, he's showing the dirty water going into the system and the clean water coming out. So again, very high end, uh, you know, wastewater treatment equipment for removing hydrocarbons. We see the application, as I said, filtration is either generated by contaminants that uh, a coalescing oil water separator cannot remove entirely, so you'll need filtration, or strict discharge requirements. So here we have a new installation at Memphis, Tennessee Airport for Delta Airlines. Uh, the discharge regu regulations or authority having jurisdiction required the above ground separator and then also this filtration skid to polish the water down to parts per billion. So it's regulatory driven on this, this installation. This is another one where we did uh, in Suffolk County, Long Island. Uh, this is a, uh, an installation where we have six 50,000 gallon jet fuel tanks above ground and Southwest came into this regional airport, uh, increased operations, uh, so they decided to increase their fuel capacity. And uh, because the location of this airport was is sitting on a, a water aquifer, an underground water supply for the drinking water for the residents of Suffolk County, the authority having jurisdiction, which is the health department of Suffolk County, requires uh, non-detectable levels of hydrocarbons coming off of this fuel facility. So if you look at the fuel farm, you know, that's fine. You have uh, the dike area for secondary containment around the storage tanks. Uh, you also have loading racks where tanker trucks come into the fuel area, fill up the fuel uh, tanks, and then you have another truck that comes in and pulls fuel off of the tank system to refuel the uh, aircraft. So if you look at the drawing of this design, you know, here's your, uh, to the right is your loading rack area. So those are the tanker trucks that come in and fuel the, the uh, storage tanks. So there's a pipe or a drain area that slopes down to a concrete sump all the way to the left. Your dike drainage, where you have the six 50,000 gallon fuel tanks, rainwater will collect in those dikes and then drain down to the purple slope pipe to that concrete sump that's in red. And then you have your second uh, loading rack where you're pulling fuel off of the fuel farm to refuel the aircraft. So all this is draining into a concrete pit. The concrete pit is pumping the only uh, wastewater into a room where we have a wastewater treatment system. So you have an above ground oil water separator doing its job taking out the free floating oil and solids down to 10 parts per million. 
And most areas around the country, uh, this would be acceptable to discharge from the oil water separator back into the storm drains. But because of the sensitivity of this water aquifer and the requirements by the regulators, we took the flow from the above ground separator, went through this uh, polishing skid, so we have a bag filter on that small canister, uh, the MySlex polymer filters to adsorb the hydrocarbons, and then an additional granule activated carbon system to polish the water down to those parts per billion. So the water will be discharged from here to a holding tank where the facility personnel will test the water, do record keeping, and then discharge it to the storm drains. So filtration, again, is either driven by contaminants in the waste stream or regulatory requirements like you'll see here. Now, we can also close the loop on the filtration systems. So we do uh, vehicle wash uh, water recycling systems. So this will incorporate a lot of the products I talked about today. You know, we're flowing from left to right. You have uh, the wash pad flowing the drain into an interceptor, which is typically a triple basin, three compartment interceptor. This will knock out the solids and dirt. And then we'll pump up to an above ground oil water separator. And that'll take out the free floating oil and solids down to parts per million, 10 parts per million. And then we'll go into a filtration skid. Now, instead of discharging this water, you know, into the environment, the customer is, uh, you know, reusing this wastewater as wash water for vehicles. So the water is going into a holding tank. Uh, we're hitting that with disinfectant, either by UV or ozone and the water is being sanitized and reused for washing. So that's a closed loop system. And again, I think you'll see more of these as we move on into uh, the future. Uh, water is becoming a very precious resource. So we're seeing more and more strict uh, wastewater requirements and recycling of water. So this installation was a project down here in Raleigh, North Carolina, where I am right now. And it's for the city of Raleigh uh, uh, city vehicles where they wash and, and clean uh, vehicles, street sweepers, things like that. And the wash rack is an outdoor wa wash rack at the other side of this wall, and it has a roof top on it. But the power washer uh, basically washes the vehicles. The drain will flow to an underground uh, triple basin interceptor to knock out the heavy solids and dirt. And then we pump into the uh, uh, inside of this building where you have an above ground rectangular oil water separator. Again, from there, we pump onto the uh, filtration skid that's mounted on the wall. And then we go into that uh, water tank where we hold the water for reuse. Now that blue uh, dome thing right behind the separator is an ozonator. So that'll generate ozone and purify that water in the tank uh, and kill any bacteria. So in conclusion, just wrapping up here, a couple of uh, uh, design issues. One is sizing oil water separators. When you look at outdoor or stormwater runoff applications, we're going to take the area or paved square footage that we're draining from. We're going to times that by rainfall and times by 0 0.0104. So rainfall, you know, typically we take a rainfall chart a 10-year historical rainfall for the worst case one hour rainstorm, and we'll plug in the inches of rain. Now, uh, for indoor service bay drain applications, uh, we follow the international plumbing code, and we just take area square footage times 0 0.00748. Now, on our uh, website, uh, we have both of these laid out. You can actually just go with your square footage of the facility you're designing for, and you punch in your square footage, for the outdoor, there's a rainfall chart with inches of rain around the country. And again, if you want a size for a five-year rainstorm, a 30-year, 50-year, I've seen it all. So we can uh, certainly accommodate those. You just have to call uh, Disney McLean or any of us, and we can help size the oil water separator, or interceptor for that matter. Now, one other thing to consider when you're looking at sizing is making sure you have proper oil storage capacity. So when you're sizing for a large oil spill, you know, and that could be a lube oil tank, it could be a tanker truck, it could be some sort of a fuel op operation, you want to make sure the oil water separator is sized to hold that oil spill. So again, we, we times that by two. If you have a, 
a 10,000 gallon uh, transformer, you know, holding oil, 10,000 gallons. We want to make sure we size a 20,000 gallon separated for that potential oil spill. And incidentally, when you're sizing, uh, you know, rainfall and, and gallons per minute, and then you also have to size for the oil storage capacity, whichever factor is bigger. So what I mean is if you have rainfall, let's say you have, I don't know, 1,000 GPM, and so we're looking at a 10,000 gallon oil water separator to satisfy the peak rainfall coming off that surface area, but then you have a 10,000 gallon potential oil spill, really you should specify a 20,000 gallon oil water separator to capture the oil spill. That's the bigger factor when sizing those two parameters. So HighlandTank.com, again, if you go there, there's outdoor drainage, sizing uh, applications, indoor drainage, uh, there's specifications in a word format, drawings in AutoCAD or PDF that we can, uh, you know, offer on the website. You just have to go in and click on um, installation manuals. A couple things that adversely affect performance for any of these wastewater treatment products I just presented uh, is, number one, excessive turbulence. So if you can keep your specifications or pipe runs as straight as possible coming into these wastewater treatment systems, it's best because it reduces the turbulence coming into the vessel, uh, very little elbows or 90 degree turns if possible. Pumping into the separator, again, we talked about if you have to pump into the unit, we recommend positive displacement pumps, you know, a low shearing type pump uh, versus a centrifugal pump that's going to mechanically emulsify the oil and water. Too high a feed rate, so again, if you undersize the system, it's going to get overwhelmed and cause failure. Uh, chemical detergents and, and high alkaline detergents, chemical emulsions can also affect the wastewater treatment system performance. There's a lot of uh, detergents and cleaners out there that are quick-releasing biodegradable detergents that you can clean vehicles and floors uh, in vehicle maintenance shops that will clean very well and then release the oil from the water and allow it to separate in our wastewater treatment systems. Uh, a couple other things, inefficient oil removal or sludge buildup. This is uh, really due to maintenance. And we probably move about 600 wastewater treatment systems a year, have about 17,000 uh, Highland systems around the world. And we get about five phone calls a year. You know, hey, the system's not working. Uh, you know, can you help us out? And we get right down to it. We ask, well, when's the last time you cleaned it? And they never cleaned it. So we recommend once a year, these systems get cleaned out. Uh, obviously, you have very dirty waste streams. We'd recommend the client steps up that maintenance program. But as a minimal, uh, we recommend at least once a year for cleaning. And then freeze protection. The underground uh, oil interceptors, oil water separators, are installed typically below the frost lines. Uh, when you're looking at Canada and different projects, uh, sometimes that's not possible. So we can do immersion heaters in the underground vessels. If you're doing above ground systems, as you saw, we do immersion heaters, we can do insulation, and typically these systems are also brought indoors in heated buildings. Well, that concludes the, uh, the formal presentation. Uh, are there any questions or anything I can answer before we conclude? Yeah, thanks, Tom. Uh, thanks for your time and the awesome presentation. Uh, oh, we thanks. did get a couple of questions here. Let me write them off to you. If you got, also, if you guys have any other questions, just use the chat feature and I'll, I'll relay it to Tom. But some that came in, uh, what types of detergents or cleaners should be used in the uh, oil water separator? Okay, so again, um, you want to use a, a quick-releasing biodegradable detergent. You know, all the big chemical manufacturers offer them. Uh, so it will be a non-emulsifying detergent that will clean the uh, surface but then allow the oil particles to separate in the water. Uh, so that would be a quick-releasing biodegradable detergent. Okay, okay. Uh, any other questions? Okay, uh, well, if you want to see this uh, presentation again, this will be on our YouTube channel in about a day. Um, it's at Disney McLean's YouTube channel. I can send you a link if you need to. Uh, also, uh, later today, you should receive an email from ASPE with your CEU credit. Uh, if you don't receive that, give me a call, and I'll make sure you get it. Um, again, thanks, everybody, for attending our first Disney McLean University class of 2016.
Uh, tune in next time on April 7th. We'll be covering CSST gas piping systems. Uh, thanks again, Tom. Great presentation. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, thank you. Have a good day, everybody. Bye. Bye.